Depeche Mode exploded onto the music scene in 1981 and have now a total of 14 studio albums under their belt using various different producers and we're going to discuss that in this video. Hi guys and welcome to Piano and Keyboard Artist where we discuss the artists related to pianos, keyboards and synthesizers. And today's video is all about Depeche Mode and the various producers they've worked with throughout their career. So if you're a regular subscriber to my channel, you will know we are currently in the middle of the Depeche Mode album review series. And I thought this would be a, an interesting subject to talk about within the album review series universe. And that is the subject of the producers that Depeche Mode used. Um, as I say, 14 studio albums, starting with Speak and Spell up until the 2016 Spirit. They have fundamentally changed their sound a lot. If you listen to their body of work, this is something I've always been very, very complimentary to Depeche Mode about is, is the fact that their albums always change. They always make a conscious uh, a d decision to change the sound. I mean, even if you think with, by the time Violator came out in 1990, whereas most bands, if they had that type of success, would go, okay, that's the formula, we'll stick with it. And it was very risky because Violator, when it came out, was such a groundbreaking record and it is still the electronic record by which every other electronic record is measured. I always rate Violator as the quintessential electronic album of all times. Call me biased, but I just do. So imagine this, you have a career, you release something like Violator. The natural decision would probably be to be, okay, we found the formula, let's do Violator 2 or, you know, just follow on from that formula. But they didn't because after Violator, they changed their approach again and they went on to do the um, Songs of Faith and Devotion, which was once again very controversial. And a lot, most of you de devotees and Depeche Mode fans out there love uh, Songs of Faith and Devotion. But there are a few of you who didn't like that move to that really sort of rocky kind of thing. If, if we take our friend Gary Newman, who we talk about a lot on this channel, we know he's had a very turbulent and vibrant career. But when he really sort of found his sound, especially from the sort of 2000 Pure album, that was kind of like he locked into that. And pretty much all Gary Newman's albums since in the last 20 years have been, I don't want to say the same, but he has really kind of focused in and locked into that sort of what I like to call brutalist, <clears throat> grungy, goth sound. And I love it. But he has just focused on that one sound. And a lot of bands do that. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's debatable. But what I'm trying to illustrate is, is that Depeche Mode always, and still up until this day, always stick their neck out and, 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 and take risks. And as I say, when Violator came out, it was just the ultimate album. And as I say, most bands would have just repeated the formula. But Depeche Mode don't do that. Remember Depeche Mode's philosophy in the start, it was never use the same sounds twice. Uh, you know, don't, don't use presets generate everything from scratch and that is why sampling became an integral part of their sound because they could go and hit and record sounds you know industrial and sounds from around and combine that into their music and and that that allows you to have a very unique type of sound so innovation has always been at the forefront of Depeche Mode's philosophy um, and as we as you know uh, it's coupled with great songs and Hence, we have this outstanding band. So let's go back to 1981, when Daniel Miller essentially took Depeche Mode under his wing. I'll take you under my wing, somebody should. <laughs> I've mentioned this on many of my videos, and I cannot stress enough the importance of Daniel Miller in Depeche Mode's longevity. Had Depeche Mode signed to a bigger label, I would go so far as to say they would probably have not lasted as long. I mean, I doubt they'd be around. And I've got a video series coming out soon, which I'm calling the Mute Records Special. 
And Mute Records, as far as I'm concerned, is the most important label in the history of electronic music, as far as I'm concerned. And in that video series, starting with this one, which is coming first, I want to explain why I feel Mute Records is so important and has influenced not only electronic music, but, you know, the culture of modern music. So Speak and Spell, which was released in 1981, was essentially produced, co-produced by Daniel Miller and Depeche Mode. And it's a great album, Speak and Spell. It's, it, you know, you listen back to it now, it's got a very honest sound. It's, it, it's, it's what I like to call, it's a very from synthesizer to tape kind of um, sound. It doesn't have any sort of like atmospheric sounds. It's more just like drums, bass and melodies and, and, and voices. So it's a very honest sounding album. And as I say, do check out my Depeche Mode album review series where I talk about each album in a lot of detail. 1982 saw A Broken Frame, and A Broken Frame, as we know, was the album where Martin Gore had to take the reins of songwriting because it's well documented that Vince went, adios, I'm out of here. And as I've spoken in my previous videos on my album review series, is that that was a very brave move. I mean, to get success and get in the charts and get onto Top of the Pops and then just go, see ya, I'm out of here. Vince Clark was very brave. But that was a very necessary move. And I've always talked about Vince Clark leaving being a good thing because we got, you know, he, he's been successful and Depeche Mode have been successful as well. But anyway, uh, back onto topic. This album, once again, A Broken Frame was co-produced with uh, Daniel Miller. And Daniel Miller, I feel, as I will discuss in the Mute series, uh, he really lets, if you look at his catalogue of artists, he really lets his artists kind of go their own way. Whereas, you know, big labels, they are just obsessed with return on investment because that's what record companies are. They're not music lovers as they used to be. They, you know, they're hard-nosed banks. They give you money, but they want a return on investment. And this is where I think Daniel Miller was so important, was, was giving them free reign to kind of carve their own way. But anyway, we'll talk about that more in my Mute series coming soon. But A Broken Frame was a decent record. And, you know, it's it's very different to Speak and Spell, uh, not only uh, in its in terms of its style, but also sonically. And once again, Daniel Miller giving the band the freedom to express themselves the way they wanted to. So this was Daniel Miller being the producer and manager, um, and apparently just on the agreement of a handshake would seal the contract. So Daniel Miller essentially producing or co-producing Speak and Spell and A Broken Frame. We then get onto construction time again. Now this is interesting how they got onto Gareth Jones, and I also talk about Gareth Jones being incredibly important, uh, you know, in the sort of formative years, because he was really, he really understood the sampling sound. As I said in my album review series, Gareth Jones was very into sampling and innovation, and he was really into acoustic spaces. He was fascinated by, instead of recording something and then adding reverb and delay to it in post-production. He liked the idea of actually capturing acoustic spaces within nature. And it's well documented when they were working um, in Hansa, uh, how they would record song. I'm thinking of songs like People Are People. Just listen to that song really, you know, when you listen to it loud, you can actually hear the space behind the kick uh, and 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 this and 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 some of the metallic sounds and as I explained on my album review series, uh, the way they did that was in Hansa they would have these large open spaces and you know he talked about using like the stairwells and 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 all and various different rooms. The approach that Gareth took was groundbreaking and the band used to look at him like, what the hell are you doing? Because Dave Gahn talked like when, when he went into the studio the first time to work with Gareth. Gareth is a very hyperactive kind of guy. You know, he's very energetic and enthusiastic and loads of energy. And apparently going into the studio to work with Gareth Jones is, 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 is like a force of nature. 
he's very energetic and he's like this nutty professor. Uh, Dave talked about there were like cables running around. It, it wasn't a a a um a pristine studio. It, it was a real sort of like work in progress. Lots of mics and 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 you know big PA systems. And what he did was they would hire in big sort of PA systems, which were meant for sort of projecting sound to large audiences. And they would use use these PA systems to record the sound in rooms. So typically, what they would do is um, they would record the sound from a synthesizer, you know, onto tape, but they would also, to get the room effect, they would take an output from the synthesizer, um, and then into the PA, and then play that keyboard part through the PA, whilst recording the sound from the room at a very high volume. So when you get back to the mixing process, you're then combining the signal with the your the sound that you've got from the synthesizer or the sound that you've created but you're also blending it with the the sound of the room and that was brilliant so it, it and, and that is and now that you know that um if you're a producer it's probably not so uh such a such a revelation but if you know if you're just a music fan and now that you know that listen to the uh gareth jones trilogy the construction time again um some great reward and black celebration and just listen to that that uh how he captured space and he talks about when they got on to black celebration that um in those days it was all about atmosphere and to them atmosphere equals reverb and in hindsight um as when i interviewed um dave bascombe jumping forward a little bit Dave Bascombe did say that back in those days, they did all tend to overuse reverb a little bit too much. And that is interesting because if you listen to records these days, depending on what genre you listen to, um, records from that period did have a lot of reverb. And also that's because uh, a lot of new reverb um, machines were coming onto the market, uh, modules that created uh, uh, reverb sounds. And and, you know, if you're a producer, you know what it's like whenever you get a new piece of kit, you want to incorporate it into into your into your productions. And that is why, you know, with new reverbs and delay machines coming out at that time, there was the tendency to overuse these these um, this technology. But coming back to, to Gareth Jones, Gareth was really, really, really um, obsessed with the, the the notion and the idea of acoustic spaces and when you listen to the Gareth Jones trilogy, listen to those three albums and bear that in mind. And it does kind of make sense, even if you don't understand music production. 1984 saw the release of their fourth studio album, Some Great Reward. And once again, pushing the frontiers of sampled sound um, and taking the approach that they did on the first album, but just taking it a step further. And the songwriting in... Um, some great reward is a little bit more poppy. Not that it's not that Depeche Mode are ever sort of commercially pop, but the Construction Time Again album was very sort of like uh, it was talking about like the handshake seals of contract. I don't care if you're going nowhere, just take good care of the world. It, it was it was looking at sort of like environmental issues and stuff. Whereas when we look at the subject matter of uh, some great reward, we can see the sex and dominations, the name of the game. Martin, you kinky bastard. <laughs> Black Celebration was released in 1986 and was the fifth studio album. And this once again saw them pushing the frontiers of sampled sound. But now at this point, sampling wasn't new. It wasn't something that was in its infancy. So it was really um, just taking the approach and, you know, trying to move it forward. And Black Celebration, as I say, as, as we'll talk about in my Mute series, uh, was a album that... <sighs> Daniel Miller was not very keen about when he heard the, you know, when he heard the demos, he just thought, oh, there are no songs here, it's all very downbeat. But in hindsight, I do rate Black Celebration as one of the most outstanding concept albums, uh, you know, in electronic music history. And it is indeed, as far as I'm concerned, a concept album. And that concluded the 
Gareth Jones trilogy, Construction Time Again, Some Great Reward and Black Celebration. And these three albums are really albums that resonate highly with you, the, you know, the Depeche Mode fans. And some people rate these as their favorite three albums of all time within the Depeche Mode catalog. 1987 saw the release of the sixth studio album, Music for the Masses. And this was the time where Depeche Mode decided, okay, we've used Gareth Jones now for three albums. And I think they joked about Gareth was probably just fed up of working with them. Because let's remember that when they did the Black Celebration um, album, they had this philosophy or, or this mindset that they would really live the album. And I think they went into the studio every single day for like three months. Uh, so they really wanted to capture the sort of annoyance you would experience if you saw the same people every single day. I don't want to get philosophical, but I've talked about this on my Black Celebration album review, how that tension and that, you know, just that claustrophobia that you can imagine uh, develops from being around the same people all the time, that really made itself into its record. As Alan Wilder said in, in an interview, sometimes through advers adversity you can produce your best work. But anyway, he was referring more to uh, Songs of Faith and Devotion uh, when he said that. But yeah, they decided we need a fresh approach, a new producer. And this is why I believe uh, it was Dave Garn who decided Dave Basco after he heard um, the songs of the Big Chair album and really was impressed by it. Now, if you guys have been following me, you know I did go down to interview Mr. Dave Bascombe. It was a dream come true and a very, very interesting series. And Dave Bascombe, a really, really down-to-earth, easy to approach kind of guy. And what I'm thinking of now is it's interesting when you look at all the producers that they've used. It's funny how they used Gareth for three albums and then Dave Bascombe comes along and they only use him for one album. Now, one of the questions I had to ask Dave Bascombe because apparently um, Alan Wilder did say that Dave Bascombe was more of an engineer as opposed to a producer. And Dave Bascombe did say that. As I say, I will leave links in the description below. Do, do yourself a favor and watch that interview. It was really, really interesting to, to hear Dave Bascombe answer all the questions we always wanted to ask him. And Dave Bascombe did say that he was indeed more of an engineer because Dave really, I don't think he was kind of pushy. He kind of went, okay, I'm here to make this album. What are we going to do, boys? And they came in and they said, okay, we've got this philosophy. Never use the same sound to us. Don't use guitars. Never use hi-hats. To which Dave Bascombe went, don't use hi-hats. So Dave Bascombe really was kind of, okay, carry on, boys. And I'm here. I'm going to engineer this. And he did a fantastic job in engineering it. But Dave Bascombe did say that Alan Wilder really was instrumental in this and many have said that Alan Wilder really produced this album whereas Dave Bascombe was more of the engineer and did the final mix at the end. On that interview with Dave Bascombe, Dave and I also talked how music for the masses was kind of like an sort of like a, a precursor to songs of faith and devotion and if you think of it think of music for the masses when music for the masses came out it was very rocky sounding and that is obviously because Dave Bascombe did put his sort of signature sound on of course the album is very Depeche Mode but you must understand obviously with Dave Bascombe doing the engineering he would be putting a, a, a lot of his taste you know would go into the album as far as the mix and and you know the, the, the sort of engineering were concerned um and Music for the Masses does sound very different to, you know, the previous three uh, um, Gareth Jones albums. You know, it has a more sort of, sort of like a more, kind of like, a, I don't, when I say flat, I don't mean flat as in bad, but it's kind of like if you think of Never Let Me Down Again, it's like, da, da, do, da, da, dun, da, 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 it's got this kind of like droning open sound. Whereas if you think of the the kind of the Gareth Jones records, I'm thinking of people of people. Duh, 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 dum, dum, dum. It's, they, they kind of tend to pop. It, it's almost like they they it it tends to pop out the speakers more. Um, I'm using very sort of uh, these aren't technical terms, by the way. These are just like emotional terms. But music for the masses 
did have a more rocky sound than anything they'd done up until that period. And of course, when it came out, people were going, oh, you know, Depeche Mode fans were going, oh, this is a bit too rocky. But then, of course, this album did bring other people on board who were not Depeche Mode fans. But coming back to what I said about this album sounding similar to Songs of Faith and Devotion is think about music for the masses and then think of Songs of Faith and Devotion. Uh, both, I mean, D Devotion was a very rocky album, but this does have elements of rock. Now, if you separate those two and between those two albums, you had Violator. Violator is fundamentally a different beast. Violator is a very metronomic uh, Techno-ish kind of album. It's very minimalistic. Where if you listen to, uh, if you listen to songs of faith and devotion, and if you listen to music for the masses, they've both got very sort of rocky, sort of more like epic type sound. Whereas uh, Violator is more of a, it's called more minimalist. Although there are a lot of layers behind the scenes, believe me, um, and 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 a more sort of like techno-y kind of uh, uh, vibe. So. So yeah, um, and once again, this comes back to what I was saying, how they how they always change their approach. And D Dave Bascom did talk about how he believed that he did introduce the band to the, you know, the, the concept of feedback, you know, like, like guitar feedback. And, and, and that is something you can hear sort of from that period onwards, uh, from Music for the Masses, how they did even through Violator, they've got like you. They've got like this feedback. You will hear like these uh, uh, distorted guitars or guitar-like sounds in the background. You know, for the for the purpose of creating ambience and effect. The seventh studio album was released in 1990, and this was Violator, one of the most outstanding electronic albums of all times. And I did ask. Dave Bascom in my interview, I'm always interested, how would Violator have sounded if Dave Bascom had done it? Or how would Music for the Massive Masses have sound if um, if um, Flood had done it? And, and these are interesting questions. They're probably silly questions. But Dave Bascom was very gracious and he did say that he don't he did not think he himself would have been able to have done what, you know, Mark Ellis or the producer Flood had done. Because let's, let's face it, um, Flood was a very different type of producer, whereas I get the idea that Dave Bascom is very laid back and he probably went, okay, boys, yeah, what do we want? Okay, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, just watch him. He's a really laid back kind of guy. Yeah, 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 we can do that. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. That's not to say he's not deadly serious and a professional. I just don't think he was going to be that pushy. But then again, I don't know what the brief was. It really depends on the conversation he had with Daniel in the beginning. And I, I believe it was just something like, okay, just let them make this record. But... I think by the time Violator came, and that really opened people's eyes. So, so the, you know, the, the ante had been lifted. And I really think they were at a point now with, you know, with the songwriting and as a band, they had matured and they really wanted to try something new and push the envelope, you know, once again. So I think it was what, what I, I don't know what the brief was that Flood was given, but Flood really was the guy, as far as interviews have said, who came forward and said something along the lines of all your preconceived ideas are crap. You know, all this crap of never using the same sound twice and all this crap about never using a guitar. We're going to throw that all out the window and we are going to do whatever we need to do to make the ultimate record. And fuck me, this is the ultimate record. Um, <laughs> it, it, there, are, there are a few uh, interviews online and... Um, a few conference, uh, a few lectures with uh, Mark Ellis Flood talking about how he produced this album. And I love the way he impersonates Martin when they talked about how they, you know, how Enjoy the Silence was taken from being a very sort of like somber, downbeat uh, ballad and how they how they moved it into this direction of being almost like a, like a, like a, like a disco track. And I love the way he does the impersonation of Martin going, no, oh, it's not my kind of idea for disco. Don't like it. <laughs> Flood was the producer that I feel raised this band to the next level. And that was also now that Alan Wilder had really sort of obviously in the previous albums had shadowed all the other producers because Alan always had a keen interest in the studio. The other guys weren't interested. Uh, even Martin, I think... It was like, I've heard in documentaries that Martin's not very precious in the sense that as long as the song comes across 
the way he sort of envisions it and it doesn't deviate too far away, he's quite happy. But he's not going to sit there with uh, headphones and tweak a hi-hat for, um, you know, for two days as, in, as uh, you know, Mr. Francois Kavokin did, as they said. He would be sitting in the corner with a, with, with a set of headphones and he would tweak a hi-hat sound for, for like a week. But as Martin said, but when you heard that hi hat, it was a very good, <laughs> very good hi hat sound. So, and 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 this was one of the other reasons that we, one of the other things we cannot, um, not talk about is the what is the great mixing that uh, France Francois Kavokin did on the Violator album. This album is absolutely stunning, and I don't want to go into too much detail because, as I say, we're in the middle of my album review series. We're now in the middle of Music for the Masses, and I can promise you the Violator album review series is going to be massive, so I cannot wait to talk about that. So Mark Ellis, Flood, was absolutely the right guy at the right time with tremendous experience, and Alan Wilder talked about... Uh, Flood having a very sort of 360 sort of knowledge in the studio. You get engineers who are not musicians, they're, they're just engineers, but then you get those people who are engineers, musicians, uh, and, and Flood was one of those, and, and uh, he understood what Alan called screwdriver work, like he understood how to use a, you know, an, an analog synth, and he knew how to use um, samplers, and, and he understood structure, and you know everything so he was just the right man at the right time and then of course when they went on to do the eighth studio album which was obviously songs of faith and devotion which was the album which nearly gave mark ellis a uh, a, a nervous breakdown and and the band as well this was once again just upping the ante and raising it to another level and as i say i don't want to go into too much detail about this because i will cover this in detail in my album review series but just understand that Mark Ellis Flood is probably the most popular producer um, I'd say alongside uh, Gareth Jones. Their ninth studio album Ultra came out in 1997 and of course a lot had happened Alan Wilder had left the band in the on the 1st of June 1995 and of course we're not going to go too much into the history we know all about Dave's drug addiction and everything but it was when Alan left, they decided, okay, we need to work in different ways. And Ultra was a very good album. And listening to Ultra now with what I know as a, produ uh, as a producer and as I've improved myself, I always liked Ultra, but I really like it now. It's a very, very good album. Some great tracks and very innovative. Uh, songs like Barrel of a Gun, uh, Home, uh, standout track. And for this album, it was decided to use Tim Simonon. Now, I think Tim Simonon did a fantastic job on this album. It was a very, very good album. Um, obviously, obviously, Kerry Hopwood, who did a lot of the programming, he also did some very, very good production on this as well. It's a very, very good album. And it is, as Alan Wilder said in an interview, it is kind of like a spillover album from uh, Songs of Faith and Devotion. You can, you can kind of hear... As Alan said, it's uh, it, it it continues the rough edge which they cultivated in the previous album, and it does. And once again, it is although it has elements of the previous album, it's a very different album. And once again, full respect to Depeche Mode for always changing their approach. And this was an album that almost never got finished because. Dave was in such a state. They did get to a point where they thought, okay, maybe Mar this, should, this will be a Martin Gore solo album because, you know, Dave was in such a state. But anyway, this is all about the producers. Tim did a fantastic job. And what's interesting is, is to hear that Tim is no longer in the music business. Apparently, he runs a meatball shop uh, in America somewhere, um, which, which, which is, um, well, I'm sure he's very successful, but it just goes to show how the how the music industry can be so unpredictable and uh, yeah i'm not going to say any more than that but tim who was you know uh, formerly from bomb the bass did a fantastic job on this and then of course tim went on to produce their next uh, body of work which was the 1997 um only when i lose myself single now that single was released as a uh, a single to promote their body of work which was the 86 to 1998 
almost like when they released their 81 to 85 single uh, uh, singles collection, they released It's Called the Heart and Shake the Disease. So once again, uh, for the 86, 98 compilation, they released the Only When I Lose Myself. And Only When I Lose Myself, this was my, I always sort of put this down as my, this was kind of like the closing of the chapter for me to, to the sort of, uh, to the brilliant Depeche Mode. Um, I'm not saying they're not good anymore, but that to me, that was like the last sort of Depeche Mode song that I heard that, I, that really made my, you know, that really made me go, oh my God, I love this. And I'm afraid to say I haven't really heard much uh, recently, although this stuff's not bad. I just haven't heard anything that none of their recent songs have had that reaction as what Only When I Lose Myself has done to me. And remember um, our friend, Mr. Brian Griffin, who did all the uh, the first five album covers he did them he directed the music video and it's also one of my favorite music videos and we will be getting brian in on this channel to talk about his time and how he produced and directed that music video the 10th studio album was exciter and it came out in 2001 and i've always referred to exciter as depeche mode on vacation or depeche mode on holiday and that is because it has once again a such a different tone and vibe and everything and the producer for this one was Mark Bell, you know, God rest his soul, rest in peace, Mark Bell. Mark Bell did very good work on this album. I'm not going to um, say, I mean, this is not one of my favorite albums. Listening back to it now, it is not as bad as what I thought it was when it first came out. I, it, it was never bad. I just wasn't a fan when it came out. So you must remember, I, the reason this album was such a shock was because, you know, when you, if you take songs from, if you listen to like Black Celebration and Music for the Masses and then you had Violator and then you had Songs of Faith and Devotion and you, they, and then Ultra and they were in this real sort of moody, dark place, black, you know, black album covers and dark mood. And then this comes out, it's like a big green album cover with a sort of phallic sexual symbol, like a dildo on the front. And you're going, okay. And then when I heard that first, the first time I heard... Um, uh, bum, bum, bam, bam, bum, 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 as your bony fingers close around me. I just thought, this really sucks. I never liked that. And I, I'm still not very... It's one of those songs that I've kind of had to force myself to like. But listening to it now, I can appreciate the production. And, and, and indeed, listening to this album, I think Mark Bell did a very good job. Because you must remember, at this point, Martin Gore was suffering from writer's block. And... You know, it, it 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 wasn't it wasn't the usual album where he had like an abundance of demos to work from. Martin did struggle at this point, and but actually, if I if I think think of songs like Shine, um, you know, this is not a bad album. I think it is good. It has it definitely has a different tone. As I say, to me, this is Depeche Mode and Holiday. It's kind of like Dave Garn with his tan and Martin with Martin with his new. Um, pearly whites, his new uh, white teeth. And, you know, on the videos, the videos like to free love, they're all tanned and it's got the real sort of like California. As I say, this album is Depeche Mode on holiday. I'm thinking of songs like, um, uh, we're the honeyest boys, we're the... Yeah, I was just like, okay, you're losing me here. But once again, once again, when I criticize it, I have to give them credit for going, this is great that you guys actually have the balls to actually challenge yourself and 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 come out of your comfort zone and I, and I and I always say that about Depeche Mode I've got so much respect for them for doing just that as much as I don't sort of like songs like um can you feel a little love um I always felt that that song was was a little bit on the lame side however I, th I think listening to that song now as you know with the producers is um it's got some very, very good production in it. And I actually, I put it to you this way, many years ago when it came out, I didn't like it. But now, now that I've gotten older and I understand music better, I actually kind of like this album. And it is not the bad album. I mean, if you'd asked me 15 years ago, I would have said, yeah, uh, this album sucks. But I wouldn't say that now. I would actually say I kind of like this album it, it's kind of warming I'm kind of warming to it and what I liked about it is it, it, it has a really different vibe it's not that as Martin said like when they released this album you know he said he said all the album covers were black 
up in, or a lot of them were, and they just wanted something different. So once again, full respect to Depeche Mode for pushing the boat out and trying something different. And Mark Bell did a very, very good job. I would give, uh, I, I, I would rate the production on this album to be very good as well. Um, it has, it has a, a very glassy, a very sort of like digital kind of sound. And that's not to say they didn't use analog synths. Uh, when I talk about it, it has a digital type of sound. I mean, these are just emotional terms. They're not technical, but it, 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 it was sort of, at this point where I went, oh, it's a bit clean sounding. Um, I was never a fan of that song. Like all soul sisters and soul brothers. I mean, it's probably, it's not a bad song, but I just thought it was a bit lame. But not a bad album, guys. Not a bad album. But I just think they, just a bit too clean sounding. And, but not a bad album. As I say, we'll go into detail on it in the album reviews. But uh Mark Bell did a fantastic job. Uh, rest in peace, Mark Bell. 2005 saw the release of the 11th studio album, Playing the Angel. And when this came out, I really sat up and I went, okay, they're back. I saw, this was the last album in the, you know, in recent times where I sort of heard it and I went, okay, well, there's Depeche Mode. I can see that. I didn't recognize Depeche Mode in Exciter. Uh, as I say, looking back at it, at it now, I don't hate the album. But this to me was, you know, when I first heard uh, Pain That I'm Used To, I thought, wow, you know, that, that is a Depeche Mode. Um, Nothing's Impossible was another standout track. Um, you know, what? And, and this was, I, I believe this is the first album that Dave Garns started contributing songs. Of course, we're talking about the producers here, and the producer for this album was um, Ben Hillier. And what's interesting is, you know, Depeche Mode, how they change, they keep changing their approach and, you know, always trying to think out the box and, you know, shock you and, you know, just... That we, I, I get the idea when Depeche Mode start an album, they'll sit there and go, okay, how can we make this different? How are we going to know people we're here, but in a way you've never heard us before? But that also, what surprised me is, is that they've used Ben Hillier for three albums. They used him for the Playing the Angel, Sounds of the Universe, and Delta Machine. Now, I don't have a problem with anything Ben Hillier has done. I will go on to say, though, that Ben Hillier is probably the producer that gets criticized the most within the Depeche Mode albums. Um, most people I've spoken to, whether it be producers or fans, tend to criticize him the most. Now... I liked the sound of playing the angel. Playing the angel did get criticized. Well, everything gets criticized, you know. Some people love it, some people hate it. But one of the things that a lot of people did criticize playing the angel was for was for its production. It's got a very gritty, it's got a very loud sound. Now, remember this was in the peak of the loudness wars, and I'm gonna be doing a video on the loudness wars and explain to you guys who are not producers what that means and Anyway, this was in the peak of, basically the loud, the loudness wars was a a war where um, bands would always try to make their music louder than the previous one. So so if you've got a band, you release music, and then I release music, and I, I, I try to master my music to be louder than yours. Because um, humans, uh, our perception is always, um, when something is played to you, you always tend to favor something that's louder. Uh, it's like when you eat stuff, something that is sweeter, it'll stand out more. But anyway, that's a separate video. But there was a conscious decision on this record to, to uh, forget about the marshing, but to give it a really sort of crunchy, edgy kind of sound. And I saw Ben Hillier talking on a documentary how they wanted this kind of gritty, uh, edgy sound. And I think they used a lot of bit crashes and distortion. And of course, the mastering was um, added to that it's got a very limited, uh, when I say limited, I'm talking in, in terms of production. It's it's a very full on album uh, from the first press play from um, the first song. Yeah, a pain that I'm used to. It's got a very brutal, uh, aggressive, brutalist start to an album. Um, I do like this album. I think songs like The Darkest Star. I think Ben Hillier did a, a, a great job. But if we look at... As I say, Ben Hillier does get criticized. Um, and, and he is probably, I don't want to say the least popular producer, but 
th there's no one I've spoken to that criticizes Flood or criticizes Bascombe or criticizes uh, uh, Miller or, or Jones, but but people uh, people are on the fence about Ben Hillier. I, I don't think he's. Um, I think playing the Angel was a great album. And then they went on to release their 12th studio album, which of course was Sounds of the Universe. That didn't really do anything for me. And then when they released their Delta Machine album in 2012, um, these albums, um, I'd say, I'll put it to you this way, guys. I'm such a Depeche Mode fan that with a lot of their earlier albums, you could tell me, you can say to me, some great reward. Song number seven, what is it? And I'll be able to tell you which song it is. I'll be able to play most of the songs on the piano and on the keyboard. I'd be able to sing them for you uh, and, and, and get all the lyrics right. But I found that with the last sort of four Depeche Mode albums, if you played me a song, I would not be able to tell you which album it was from. I apologize for that. It's just I haven't. And that might just be because I'm becoming older and boring. But uh, And uh, yeah, there are many reasons for that, which we're not going to delve into in this video. But... Ben Hillier, as I say, he did three albums. And the question I always asked was, why did they use him for three albums? And that's not to say he did a bad job. Um, it's, you know, technically speak, I mean, I don't like some of the songs on the, you know, the more recent albums. Uh, you know, some I like more than others. But that's not Ben Hillier's fault. Um, I'm not saying the production's bad. But, of course, there are people who criticize what Ben Hillier has done. Something that does stand out on the sort of Ben Hillier productions is the, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Sounds of the Universe, is great separation and, and, and sort of stereo panning. Um, but then again, uh, a friend of mine, as old, good old Simon Forsyth, shout out to you, brother. Uh, he did say that in his opinion once, he said, Sounds of the Universe is probably one of the coldest sounding records he's ever heard, despite the fact that they were using analog equipment. And I remember when Sounds of the Universe came out, uh, the whole sort of gimmick behind this was, oh, um, this is all done with analog equipment or something along that line. Um, I know Martin was going onto eBay and buying a lot of secondhand analog equipment and stuff. And whereas we music producers and geeks, we like all that. Uh, the general public and, and the general fan is not really interested in, in that. As I always say, it's all about the end result. People aren't really bothered about how you got to the end result as long as it sounds good. And as my friend, my mate Simon was saying, he just found that despite the fact that this Sounds of the, the Universe album was was made using only analog synths, it does have kind of a very cold sound to it. And I I understand what Simon means, but um, we will delve into that in more detail in the album review series. And then, of course, we're on to James Ford, who did the um, the last offering, which is Spirit, which came out in 2016. I didn't like Spirit. I don't want to give away too many spoilers for my, you know, I'll, I will talk about it in my album review series. You can get some of my thoughts on Spirit if you watch this video, which I did, uh, which was the... Um, Spirits of the Forest uh, video. I did say that for an album called Spirit, uh, I, I just feel this album has no soul. Um, so this was James Ford working with Depeche Mode for the first time. And I mean, he did produce Florence of the Machine, Arctic Monkeys. And, um, you know, he, he's, a, he's a great producer. Um, some of the comments and criticisms I've had from, you know, the public and fans and other producers is some people have said, why did they use James Ford? And then I said, well, James Ford's a great producer. And they went, yeah, well, he's, you know, he did the Arctic Monkeys and and Florence and the Machine. And I'm like, yeah, well, Florence and the Machine and the Arctic Monkeys are great, although I'm not a fan of them. They are great, you know, and then the productions are good. And um, I think what Depeche Mode understand is, um, is when you get someone to produce you, it's not necessarily to use someone who's a fan of yours, you know, like a real fanboy. You don't want someone like me sitting in the studio and they go, um, Hello, Vaughn. I'm um, Fletch. We're Depeche Mode. Will you produce our album? I mean, can you imagine me? I'll be like all fanboy. You don't want someone like, you know, you don't want a, someone like me or a, a a fan to produce them because I think a fan has sort of like preconceived ideas. And I think this is why Depeche Mode sort of used in the last, you know, Ben Hilly and James Ford. I think for them, it's best to get someone who's a bit neutral. And even, even if we look at uh, Mark Bell, um, 
but I think Mark Bell actually was a Depeche Mode fan. Forgive me, I may be wrong there. But I I, I think I I understand the idea of not wanting to use a you know someone who's a fan because someone who's a fan is going to have preconceived ideas and they're going to push you in a certain direction. It may or it may not be a good thing. I'm not sure. Guys, has this been a long video? We don't care. Right, guys, and now it's up to you. I've got four questions for you. Question one, who is your favorite Depeche Mode producer? Question two, which was your least favorite Depeche Mode producer? Question three, do you think it is important when Depeche Mode choose a producer that the producer is a fan of theirs or should he be neutral? Once again, should the producer be a fan or should the producer, should she or he be neutral? Because as I say, if they're biased, as they're, if they're a fan, they're going to push it in a sound that they know Depeche Mode should sound like. Whereas if it's someone who's not a fan, they're going to be more neutral. So what do you think? And the fourth question, who do you think should produce the next Depeche Mode album? Because as I say, the last album was released in 2016. We're now 2020. And if you look at their history, they usually release an album every four years. So I should think we're going to probably get an announcement, well, because of this year being written off, probably next year, I should think they will um, make an announcement. So yeah, answer those four questions in the description below. I would love to hear what you say. And, and of course, we will continue with this discussion in the Vaughan George Facebook group. Uh, which will be a lot of fun. Guys, if this is your first time to this channel, I would like to welcome you with open arms and I will hope that you will, you know, hit that subscribe button, click like and share and also join the Vaughan George Facebook group. Guys, I'm on Patreon now to those of you who want to support me. Thank you very much to those of you who are supporting me. And a lot of you have asked me um, for, you know, to, to put to put a tip feature at the bottom here. Uh, some of you have said that, you know, you want, you want to tip me or buy me a drink and and although I've never wanted to do that, um, I feel I'm giving you good value. And if you want to buy me a drink, I will graciously accept. So all the information is in the description below. Um, also, I've got some merch coming, guys. Uh, some some T-shirts uh, with, with the um, famous words used on this channel. Things like uh, Remain On Topic, Alan Wilder, Fanboy Alert. Uh, a whole set of merch available soon at the Vaughan George shop. Guys, thank you so much. I'm really enjoying this and I'm so grateful to you for your support and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Leave your comments below. Take care of yourselves. Adios.